Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm going to be reacting to How Was Swami Vivekananda in Real Life Hindu Academy. So I tried another video, but it kept cutting out. It wasn't with the internet, it was just the video itself. So let's try this one. And also, this is an interesting one. I, I've heard a few stories from Swami Sarvapriyananda's channel. It's mostly with him in the United States, and mostly him with the women. I don't know why that was talked a lot, uh, a lot about. And I did explain on those videos, by the way, why I thought that way. <coughs> but I kind of want to know a little bit more. So let's hear what uh, Lakani here has to say. <laughs> you see, this is the powerhouse. It was very difficult to live with him. All his brother disciples shuddered. In the morning when this, when this gentleman woke up and started walking up and down the monastery, they were shuddering, shuddering. Because he came in such he's such a powerhouse that you feel that you are in front of real God on earth. I'm not exaggerating, not exaggerating. And the way he would behave and the way he would act, if he looked at you, you would your your level of you know your your intensity of experience of this life would in, magnify a million fold. That dramatic. And again, his mannerism was let me just tell you, let me touch you. He set up a monastery on the bank of the river Ganga for the benefit of mankind to, pro to continue to promote this message of spirituality for mankind in Belur Mutt. Then he would get up in the morning and the Belur Mutt is progressing and there's a lot of money coming in, donations coming in, the Mutt is, the, the missionaries, the, the mission is expanding. Then he would walk out of Belur Mutt and you'll see some poor people, you'll see the shanty down there and you'll start crying. This is the real story of Vivekananda, people don't know that. You start crying. He'd come back in the monastery and said, sell everything, sell everything, give the money to these people. He had difficulty to even maintain this, this system, this discipline, the structure of the monastery. He wanted to give it away. When he was a little boy, you know, when a beggar knocked on his door, he would pick up anything that was valuable in the house and give it away. You see, when this compassion rules you, remember, not the intellect, the compassion rules you. You don't have time to think. You want to give everything away to the rest of the kingdom, the living kingdom. So imagine what happened to the brother disciples. He would walk in and say, sell everything. And they say, oh, just set it up. He wants to sell everything. And they'll shudder. They don't know. Again, they'll calm him down. But he, this is the heart of Vivekananda. Let me tell another story. There was one brother disciple called Girish Chandra Ghosh, who was a bit of a rustic, not very clever. And he was a bit of a drunkard as well. And Vivekananda used to make, pull his leg, you know, and make fun of him. One day, Swami Vivekananda was giving a talk on the Vedas. And this Girish on the coach walked in and then he said, he made a little fun, you know, pun at Girish and they said, you understand all this, don't you Girish? And Girish gave a, gave a pun back, you know, he really gave one back. We were kind of difficult, but he gave one back. He said, ah, Naren, my question to you is this, what has your Vedas done for these poor people outside? There were thousands of people starving. You see, we were aware. He said, what has your Vedas done for these thousands of people out there? In one second, this masterful, this giant, this intellectual giant was reduced to a quivering baby. He started to weep, weep. They had to console him, it's not your fault. They told him, it's not your fault. Stop crying. You see, the love he had for his people was visible every day. You could not hold him up. Any time he saw any distress anywhere, his heart went out there. This was not showmanship. You see, again, there are lots of people who do charity work, but you can see it's a bit of showmanship. They get their pictures in the newspaper and you must have a garland and all this and see how it's donated so much. With this man, it was the most natural thing. He could not help himself. He could see that. He was in love with his people. His God was the living God, the humanity that he interacted with. He used to in, in, you know, interact with lots of interesting people. Let me tell another story. He was, when he was in the United States, you must have heard the name Rockefeller, the rich giant of America in his time. Rockefeller heard of this Swami who was kind of making a big wave in the, in the, in the society of the United States. So one day when we were kind of sitting in his study, just quietly writing away something or letter or something, his door flew open. This is Rockefeller. He doesn't ask for an invitation. He just walks in. The, dro the door flew open and Rockefeller walked in. And this Swami, you see, he, 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 he knows who's come. He's fully aware who's come. He doesn't even look up. He keeps writing. And while he's writing, he says, do you know why you are here? Do you know why you are rich? In your previous life, you did lots of good things. And that's why you acquired all this wealth. But do you know what you must remember? 
you are just a, you are just a steward of this wealth. It doesn't belong to you. Don't know that it belongs to the people. You must do something for the people. You are just a steward. It doesn't belong to you. And when you tell a rich millionaire of the United States, this doesn't belong to you, and you are just a steward, and just without looking up at him, even doesn't give him the dignity of giving, looking at him directly, just looking at his own work, and just mention this. And Rockefeller was flew in a rage. He went out, you know, the door flung closed again, walked out. He said, what is, what an what a arrogant man. Doesn't even look at me and is telling me that it doesn't belong to me. He walked away. After a, this is a real story. After a few days, again this viva comes writing and again the door flew open. And then the Rockefeller threw something on his desk. He had made a, made a commitment of doing tremendous amount of philanthropic work for the benefit of his people. So he had made a special, you know, um, a, 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 a pledge of, of donating huge sums of money for the betterment of society, for philanthropic activity. He had written it up, signed it, sealed it, and he threw it on the desk of Swami Vivekananda. And he looked and then he asked, are you happy now? This is the, this is the arrogance, Swami Vivekananda caught him. Are you happy now? Don't you feel happy now? Vivekananda, without looking up, said, you should feel happy now. <laughs> why should, it's none of my business. I just told you, do it, you are doing it. So why, why are you bothering me? You should be happy now, not me. <laughs> but see, this is the power. This is the powerhouse. You see, if I was near him, I think perhaps, again, this is one thing that Vivekan said. People sometimes used to say, why did he die at such a young age? He only lived at the age of 39. Only 39. So he should have lived longer and done more work. At one stage, when he was doing his work, he told his brother disciple, he would, he would share this kind of private thoughts. He said, you know, it is time for this oak, this huge tree to fall and let other little, little saplings grow by themselves because I'm taking up too much room. So I better clear the ground. Look at the language. A couple of things. I haven't paused it in a little bit. I did just look that up, and apparently that's true. I mean, like, I don't know how much of it's true, and I didn't really get a chance to read. I just looked up to see if Rockefeller met Swami Vivekananda, and apparently <laughs> it's a thing. There's also, like, with Tesla and everything else, too. But I'll get to maybe that when everybody talk about it, too. <clears throat> and about the about him dying so young, it kind of sucks. Uh, again, you know... This is also true to Bruce Lee as well. I mean, anyone who dies young, it really sucks. Who knows what they could have done with the rest of their lives. Um, Swami Vivekananda talking about how he's, he's taken up so much room and let the saplings, you know, grow. It's like, well, you know, you can let the saplings grow still. They, you know, they do, that's how they are, you know, meant to grow. And you can die later on and <laughs> and then let the saplings grow then, you know. <laughs> you don't have to die so young. Come on. <laughs> Uh, teach a little bit longer <laughs> show the world but yeah like you know 39 geez so because I'm so overpowering I'm not allowing others to grow in their own mold this was the power of Vivekan he recognized you see the thing is another thing is this at one stage when he was giving a lecture in London in London you see this is there are his own words in a lecture he wrote somewhere he said Suddenly, when I was talking to this audience, you know what happened? I suddenly found that I could control the minds of everybody in the audience. I could really mold them, you know, to literally control the minds of everybody in the audience. I think this was an audience in Piccadilly. So I could control them and really mold them as I wish. I was in tremendous power. I suddenly felt that power surging up in me. Do you know what I say? I did. He said, I stopped speaking and walked out. I wouldn't speak. Do you know why? This Vivekan says, don't bow down to me. Don't be subservient to me. You know, and unfold spiritually in the way that suits your own requirement. Grow up, my friends. Stop bowing down to these deities, including this one. Grow up. You stand up for yourself. So straight away said, I stopped the lecture. People said, why did he, was he offended? Why did he walk out? He just walked out. He suddenly felt himself in such a powerful position. He just relinquished the power. He didn't want to use it. See, this is the power of this man. He doesn't, he doesn't overwhelm you. He encourages you to supersede him, to become better than him. See the power. No other, no other prophet has done that. They all say, come and sit at my feet, I'll sort you out. He says, don't you come near my hands. If you sit at my feet, I'll, I'll kick you. This is the difference. You know, with other deities, if you keep the deity at the back of you, it's considered to be very rude. 
with this one, I don't think you'll find it true because it's good, I can kick you from back. <laughs> a different deity. It's not a normal deity. He's broken the mold of the old deities. He's here to empower us, to make us grow and reach out and touch our real nature, which is so dynamic, so exciting, that we only heard about it as poetry, but something to experience for ourselves our oneness with the rest of creation and something to touch and experience that is what life is all about oh. <clears throat> so very interesting how was Swami Vivekananda in real life I mean, he talked about I guess his meetings with people in general I was hoping he would talk to you about how he goes to perhaps villages or, or you know, just little small towns and how he interacts with the populace more than just say you know like um no, I don't know. <laughs> Where people meet in like town halls and stuff. Hoping to know what Swami Vivekananda was like with the people as opposed to with, you know, like I guess dignitaries or or senators or whatever it may be. To see how how he uh kind of acted and what he did with the people. Now don't get me wrong, in the very beginning he talked they talked about how I believe he was, uh, I'm guessing, outside, and, you know, he had thousands of people. The one guy was telling him, what are you going to do with all these people that are starving? So I guess, I don't know if that's the only thing he did. I, I, obviously, I know he did that kind of thing. I just wish, he, I guess, a little bit more of the personal, I suppose. Like, um, he goes to people's houses and asks what they need, or, or, I don't know, help people out in some way, some... Uh, form or fashion. Uh, I just I was hoping a little bit more of the personal life, not 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 his relationship in any way, just more his, <laughs> his relationship with the people in more of a, a bit of a I won't say personal level, but more of a one to one level, like what he did with them. If if that was a thing, I don't know. I'm sure it was, but I probably wasn't documented, just because it wasn't necessarily. I guess important to document individual cases as opposed to what he did to the 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 mass and the populace. Like what he did with the the either the town or the city or the senators or the world leaders, you know those are more of a very high achievement stuff. <clears throat> but when you get to uh, see what he does with an individual people, you get to know a little bit more about him personally versus the mass, the general, you know, where you you get the general idea, but not the specifics. So. Anyways, that's my oh, not much of a reaction to how was Swami Vivekananda in real life. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.